Good morning, everyone. Welcome to CSIS. My name is Kathleen Hicks. I direct the International Security Program here. And I want to welcome you to our Maritime Security Dialogue on Maintaining Maritime Superiority. Before we begin our event today, I want to share with you our building safety precautions. Overall, we feel very secure in our building, but as a convener, we have a duty to prepare for an emergency situation. I will serve as your responsible safety officer at this event, so follow me should there uh, be any uh, fire alarm or something along those lines. Uh, the Maritime Security Dialogue brings together CSIS and the U.S. Naval Institute, two of the nation's most respected nonpartisan institutions. The series is intended to highlight the particular challenges facing the Navy, the Marine Corps, and the Coast Guard, from national level maritime policy to Navy concept development and program design. We are very fortunate to have the series sponsored uh, with support from Lockheed Martin and Huntington Ingalls Industries, and we thank them for that support. Who better to come speak to us today in the Maritime Security Dialogue than the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral John Richardson? We look forward to comments from uh, Admiral Richardson, followed by a discussion between him and the Chief Executive Officer of USNI and my partner in crime, Pete Daly. Um, and uh, thank you all of you for your attention today, and over to you, Admiral. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, everybody, and I uh, want to uh, also, just share my thanks to both CSIS and uh, the Naval Institute for hosting this today. Uh, Admiral Daly, thanks very much for all the work that uh, you do to kind of increase awareness of things maritime. And this, this uh, dialogue has been fantastic as a series of, of interchanges, exchanges. You know, uh, I was talking to somebody uh, recently, just sort of getting some advice about, okay, you know, how you, you could be a lot better at CNO if you just do these sort of things. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> they said, uh, you know, because listen, when, in terms of the messaging, you just can't do enough, right? Because people understand armies, they generally understand air forces, but navies are just weird, right? They just, uh, you guys are different. And so just keep on explaining. And so that's what we do. And I appreciate this venue. And I want to just uh, start off, you know, rather than a general overview, uh, which I am happy to do maybe during the Q&A or something like that, I want to dive in and take a look and just have a discussion about a particular issue. And, uh, you know, I've been in my position now for a little over a year, and uh, it's been a, a vertical learning curve. In fact, I'm starting to wonder when that will stop. You know, <laughs> I've got to be sort of the slowest kid in the class here because uh, I've just learned so much every day. And I've also relearned a couple of important things too. And one of those is just the absolute critical importance of making sure your thinking is as clear as it can be and that your uh, communications follow and they are unambiguous and clear as well. And uh, today I thought I would dive into one important example, uh, and I'll do so kind of in a, I'll start it off with sort of a word association game. You know, when I say a word and you kind of give me the first <laughs> word that comes to your mind. And so uh, my word is A2AD. Okay. And so what word or comes to your mind or what picture do you see? You know, to many people, A2AD, anti-access area denial, is kind of a code word, a code word that indicates that some nation has established some kind of an impenetrable keep out zone that forces can enter only at extreme peril you know, to, their, to their existence, never mind their mission. Uh, to others, A2AD brings to mind some kind of a portfolio or basket of technologies, a particular suite of technologies. And then others will depict A2AD as some a strategic approach uh, you know, regarding some employment of force or some national policy objectives or some kind of combination of the two. And so you know, in summary, A2AD for me has, is a term that's bandied about pretty freely uh, and, and lacks the precise definition that uh, it probably would benefit from. And that ambiguousness sends a variety, I think, of vague or conflicting signals depending upon the context in which that term is used, either transmitted or received. 
And I gotta tell you that to me, I, I appreciate everything through the absolute crystal clear lens of enhancing the Navy's ability to conduct its mission, uh, which is laid out in Title 10 and discussed in a design for maintaining maritime superiority, which states that the US Navy will operate at sea and be ready to conduct prompt and sustain combat to protect America from attack and to ensure the nation can project strategic influence around the globe wherever and whenever necessary in support of our national security objectives. And so to ensure clarity in our thinking and precision in our communications, we in the Navy are going to refrain from using the term AD, A2AD as just sort of a standalone acronym. They can mean all things to all people or some things to some people or almost anything to anyone. I think that we just owe it to ourselves, to the country, to be better than that. So I'm encouraging this approach really for four reasons. And let me take each one of these in order. First, the concept of A2AD is not anything new. Uh, the history of military contests is all about adversaries seeking to one-up each other by identifying their foes at longer ranges and attacking them with ever more precise and destructive weapons. This is nothing new. As technologies change, tactics change to react and leverage them. It's only relatively recently in our conversation about war fighting that we've discussed this trend as something new or something uh, different. Uh, but history has much to teach us about maintaining perspective on these developments, and that will give us insight into charting a path forward to address them. And one only has to think of Horatio Nelson at Copenhagen or the Nile, uh, Admiral Farragut at Mobile Bay. Uh, you can think of Admiral Nimitz and Admiral Lockwood in the Pacific during World War II to see that A2AD and Confronting A2AG challenges is nothing new. Indeed, controlling the seas and projecting power, even in contested areas, is exactly why our nation invests in and relies upon a naval force to begin with. So that's the first reason. Second reason is that the term denial, as in anti-access area denial, is too often taken as a fait accompli when, in fact, it really describes an aspiration. Often, I get into A2AD discussions that are supplemented by maps, right, or charts. And these maps have these red arcs that extend off coastlines. And these images imply that any military force that crosses that red line into that arc faces certain destruction. <laughs> right? It's a no-go zone, and we're just going to stay out of that place. Uh, but the reality is far more complex. It's actually really hard to achieve a hit. It requires the successful completion of a very complex chain of events. Each link in that chain is vulnerable and can be interrupted. And so these arcs represent danger to be sure, right? Something for, to be thoroughly considered. And we're going to be thoughtful and well prepared as we address them. But the threats that they are based on are not insurmountable and can be managed and will be managed. Third reason is that A2AD, in my viewpoint, is far too inherently oriented to the defense. It can contribute to a mindset that starts with, since these red arcs are so stark and impenetrable, we have to start with, you know, how do we're we going to start outside? We're going to think about how we're going to work our way from the outside in. Uh, but related to my last point, the reality is that we can fight from within these defended areas, and if needed, we will. We'll fight outside in, yes. We'll fight inside out. We'll fight from the top. We'll fight from the bottom. I'm starting to sound like Churchill at this point. Uh, indeed, we'll fight from every direction, right? And the examples that I've given, the historical examples, show that this is nothing new and has been done before. Finally, the fourth reason is that 
the A2AD threat is already actually pretty well understood. Whereas in my mind, the real challenges, the vexing challenges that we face are right around the corner. Longer range, very precise and more powerful missiles coupled with ISR systems that can detect uh, with precision at, for longer ranges. Those have been with us for some time now. We understand that dynamic. And it's true that the systems, this, this system of system gets more and more capable. And you know, one generation will beget a follow-on generation, which extends that reach just a little bit further. And it's also true that this, these systems are proliferating, they're spreading. But the essential military problem that they represent is largely the same, and we've appreciated it and understood it for some time. And it doesn't mean, again, that they don't present a challenge. But if we fixate on A2AD, we're going to miss the boat on the next challenge. We fail to consider that thing just around the corner that will entail a fundamental shift and takes the contest and competition to the next level. Just as an example, what must be done? This is a question that we're exploring. What must be done to stay ahead of our adversaries when essentially any place in the world can be imaged in real time, on demand, with video? Right? That world is right around the corner. So for those four reasons, we're going to scale down just the independent use of A2AD. The lack of precision has real consequences. Potential adversaries actually have different geographic features like choke points, islands, ocean currents, mountains. Different geographies dictate a wide variety of concepts and technologies that enemies will use to fight in those different areas. And this variety has a major impact on how US forces best seize and maintain the initiative. While there may be some universal elements to the tactics and the technologies, the concepts that we might use, there are just as many differences. And so we have to resist the temptation to oversimplify this conversation. The specifics matter. So what should we say instead? If we don't like A2AD, what do we say? And I'm afraid I'm just not going to propose replacing one acronym with another. Right? This is going to disappoint many, right? <laughs> uh, since we, we tend to try and force everything into an acronym. And no matter what I say, we will eventually get to an acronym. But uh, I will say that uh, since different theaters present unique challenges, the one-size-fit-all term to describe the mission and the challenges creates confusion, not clarity. Instead, we'll talk about the specifics the specifics of our strategies and capabilities relative to those of our potential adversaries within the specific context of geography, concepts, and technology. So our focus must always remain on maintaining maritime superiority with a deep understanding of the interplay between tactics and strategy against specific threats in specific locations to achieve that end. Our superior equipment, our agile operating concepts, our high performing teams, these will lead to better thinking and faster learning. They will combine to make us a more capable and adaptive force that will outpace any adversary, especially in a time of rising complexity. This is where our advantages really start to open us up on the competition. Uh, but it must go beyond words we must act, and we are acting. We'll continue to up our game through training, experimentation, war games, and introducing new technologies. Our scientists, sailors, and strategies are doing, uh, strategists are doing remarkable things to push today's boundaries and develop new ways to maintain our edge. We're forging deeper partnerships in the private sector and reaching more deeply into the world's of academia and industry to bring the best ideas to the table and do that faster than we are now. Similarly, we're forging deeper partnerships with like-minded naval forces around the world. Just about a week ago, 
we hosted the International Sea Power Symposium in Newport, Rhode Island, a gathering of 85 chiefs of Navy, over 100 navies represented with senior leadership. These sorts of efforts matter. The pace of change is accelerating almost everywhere we look, and the margins of victory will be thin. And more than ever, ever before, maintaining our edge depends on clear thinking, coupled with decisive action that is focused on executing our mission against today's threats and against those in the future. So have no doubt, the United States Navy is prepared to go wherever it needs to go at any time and stay there for as long as necessary in response to our leadership's call to project America's strategic influence in a wide range of operational scenarios around the globe. So thank you very much. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Well, Admiral, thanks for those remarks. Um, you already alluded to the fact that uh, you've been on station as CNO just about a year and a couple weeks. And uh, it's worth asking one time, you know, when you took command of uh, different submarines and different boats and different commands, you're always subject to conditions as found. You change your ideas. And is there something that you can point to after this first year that was either a surprise or just something that's changed that uh, has caused you to either reevaluate or uh, modify your design? Uh, you know, the design was issued sort of as version 1.0, right? Uh, and this is sort of, you know, it's like when you watch the end of a movie and you can sort of see, hey, they're setting up for a sequel here, right? You can just kind of see that uh, X-Men, you know, the next one is gonna come down <laughs> the road. And uh, we, we built the design uh, with that type of an iteration in mind. And so as we look for next steps, uh, I think that, uh, well, one, we're gonna say some things, I think, a little more specifically about acquisition, okay? We need to just focus on that a little bit uh, more clearly in terms of executing uh, a set of you know, authorities and certainly expectations in terms of the service chief's role in acquisition. And also, as I've had a chance to go out and meet with you know, senior industry leaders uh, in our sure. business and maybe just outside our business. We found that uh, there's a great desire on both sides of that relationship to speed things up, to clean out you know, the, uh, the bureaucracy, those sorts of steps, to get new technologies into the system faster. And so I think we're gonna be a little more focused on that. Uh, with respect to the uh, other lines of effort, uh, the uh, Things are, you know, we, we sort of built the whole design on the presumption that the pace is quickening. The pace is a, is a con consistent theme. And so we anticipated that uh, this, this pace would be quick. Uh, but I, I would have to say that the developments, even in the past year, uh, are probably quicker than even we anticipated. And so it just highlights that sense of urgency to get going. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks. Um, you know, there's been, uh, at least one study and some literature out there recently that suggests that the U.S. overall, that doesn't exactly point just to the Navy by any means, but suggests that the U.S. overall is being outplayed in the gray zone, the area between peace and war. And I wanted to ask you, has that, has that caused you to take any additional actions um, you, you came on board, obviously strong for the nuclear deterrent, the need to regain uh, proficiency at the high end of the war fight, mm -hmm. which I think is rightful and just. But now we increasingly find ourselves in this gray zone area, as a, another, another term, um, where unconventional, unconventional means may be required earlier uh, as a response. I just wanted to get your ideas on that. Yeah. Well, uh, that's just a, uh, a terrific question. And uh, if you think about, you know, certainly the, the entire spectrum of conflict or, or competition is really, I think, what we're talking about. And so uh, just like, you know, much of my opening statement really highlighted some of the classics, you know, the, the fundamental nature of conflict and competition. 
you know, we've got competitors out there who are thinking, they're studying us, and they are looking for every way they can to sort of exploit areas in our capabilities, technology, doctrine, what have you, uh, that they can use to, to you know, advantage at their end of the competition. Um, and uh, this is one area where it's, it's been described, and the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff has been terrific in terms of uh, highlighting this new form of competition, uh, which at any scale of, of competition you know, in conflict is no longer regional. Right? I mean, it's very difficult to point to any kind of a situation right now and say, hey, that's purely a regional matter. Right. Everything is trans-regional, if not global, right? by virtue of the new war fighting techniques, the new war fighting domains that are not only on us, but are, you know, people are becoming more skilled in practicing uh, and competing in those domains than ever before. Uh, so it's, you know, it's multi-domain, it's trans-regional, if not global, and that gives rise to all sorts of different plays in the playbook that we need to confront. And so that's what we're doing. We're sort of developing those plays in our playbook that are something, you know, options for leadership that are short of you know, what we would call classical phase three conflict, conflict. Uh, so that we've got some options for our policymakers and decisions to exercise uh, in that gray zone type of competition. Well, that's just one more question that will open it up to the audience. Um, hey, I'm sorry, can, before we go on, sure. uh, just uh, a, a big part of that uh, uh, is that uh, this is not a US only thing and so I think Part of the solution must include uh, regional security architectures and strengthening building capacity in like-minded teams uh, in different parts of the world. And so as we work with our allies and partners, enhancing each other's capability, we can help them in some ways, they can help us in many ways, but overall strengthening the regional strength, uh, the security architecture in these regions, I think is another big way forward to try and uh, be more resilient to this type of uh, competition. Thank you. Um, just this last question before we open it up. So you're, you're working on uh, obviously high-end capability, acquiring the Navy of the future, and yet you still have this relentless drumbeat of deployments and the deployment cycle that has to be met, the near-term execution. And I dare say that the Navy did not get the luxury of a timeout or a recess or a reset. Um, it had to continue with the uh, heel-to-toe deployments that uh, the Navy's been doing for 40-some uh, years. Mm -hmm. So could you talk a little bit about that, about the, the concurrency of focusing on the future, new capabilities, new plays for the playbook, and at the same time, having to meet the demands of you know 1,500 yeah. today, and how that's going. Right. I mean, you've just sort of outlined the job description for the chief of naval operations, <laughs> right? Uh, how are you going to balance uh, the need to modernize for the future versus those urgent needs that are pressing us today? Readiness. Uh, throw the manpower piece in there, and you've got it all, Pete. You know, uh, and so. Uh, it is a, a constant dialogue that we have. Uh, part of the solution, again, is working with industry in, a, in as collaborative a way as possible to make sure we're not missing any opportunities to bring that modernization to the Navy uh, and the Joint Force uh, as quickly and at, at the best price possible. And, and I, 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 as I said before, I just think that there's a lot of opportunities. And many of those opportunities are actually being suggested to me by our industry partners in terms of, hey, we could go faster and we could get it to you cheaper than, uh, than the current system uh, allows. And so we're exploring those uh, areas. Uh, part of it is looking at new operational concepts. So how do you in, improve capability uh, beyond just technologies, right? We're not going to be able to buy our way out of this thing no matter what approach we take. And so as you think of new combinations, in fact, many of the revolutions in uh, military affairs were not dependent upon a new tra you know, technology. They were dependent upon new combinations of current technologies. And so 
we're working particularly closely with the Marine Corps in this area to make sure our naval warfighting uh, operations and concepts are as creative as we can be, that we're not uh, trapping ourselves with intellectual structures that, you know, whose time may be passed. Uh, and so uh, the Air Force and us are starting to talk about these larger networks. And as you stitch things together, you, know, you allow more combinations of our current capabilities those combinations can be very agile, very capable, very hard to contend with. And so, uh, you know, from a mathematical standpoint, you know, everybody talks about Moore's Law, and that's an exponential curve. But as you start to look at different combinatorics of things, you start approaching kind of factorial types of curves. And, so, you know, those can beat exponential possibilities. And so I think that this operational concept area is one that we've got to continue to be exploring and, and just as I said, it's got to go beyond just ideas. You've got to get out there at sea. You've got to connect these things physically, operate the, them uh, together. And that's exactly what we're doing. OK, well, great. And uh, I'd like to take a few questions, if I could. Um, that gentleman right there with the blue tie. Thank you, Admiral, and thank you, DCSIS, as well, for bringing us all together today. Um, Admiral, I want to ask, since you mentioned the Navy uh, changing to a more region-specific playbook, um, does the Navy at this time have any plans for the Arctic region? Uh, any future thoughts on how uh, naval affairs are going to be changing up there? Thank you. Yeah, uh, that's a great question, one that comes up. And so climate change has really focused a lot of attention on the Arctic. Uh, the Arctic ice cap is as small as it's ever been in my time in service, right? Which is uh, probably longer than you've been born. But uh, <laughs> the uh, so what does that mean? Well, from my standpoint, uh, well that gives rise to transit lanes that are open more often now than they have been ever. Uh, it gives rise to continental shelves and the resources on those shelves that are uh, uh, you know, accessible right, that uh, were not accessible before. Uh, so, uh, you know, how do, we, how do we address that? Um, well, we do so, uh, one, that's informed by, you know, the pace of things that are moving uh, up there. And so while there are a lot of opportunities, in fact, we just discussed this, uh, we, we held our staff talks with the Coast Guard just uh, last week, and a big part of those talks, a big topic on those was the Arctic. And so it's important that, uh, while there are things changing up there, they're changing at a certain pace. And uh, it's, it's not like there's a, you know, a gold rush up to the North Pole right now. And so there is some time to do this uh, smartly. And then we also have to be mindful that both the Navy and the Coast Guard team, sort of, sort of the, the two maritime forces uh, that are up there, the Marine Corps also uh, exercising up there, will maintain the ability to operate in the Arctic, uh, but we do so on a priority basis. And so if we think of the other uh, threats that we confront, we'll get up there uh, as we can uh, to make sure that we uh, remain capable of operating up there, we remain aware of how things are changing and are ready to uh, respond appropriately. I have to ask, uh, did the word icebreaker come up? In the icebreaker. Yes, yeah. it did, of course. And so uh, you know, the, we're working very closely with the uh, Coast Guard to work forward in that. Okay. Uh, this gentleman right here on the aisle. Admiral Cyril Lopez, CNA. Sir, in your design, uh, you talk about achieving high velocity learning at every level. Nine months into that, I'm wondering, have uh, how do you think the state of that is going for every level? And do you have mile markers of success to know the Navy is on a trajectory that you want it to have? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, of all of the lines of effort in the design for maintaining maritime superiority, that uh, green line of effort that talks about high velocity learning is probably the newest uh, thing, you know, the, the strangest thing, uh, and the least understood thing, to be honest. And so, as with so many other of the lines of effort in the design, we've taken this year to sort of talk a lot about it, right? I mean, it's sort of like putting commander's guidance out when you put a, a document out like the design. And uh, that while there was a tremendous amount of thinking and, and tremendous amount of collaboration to bring it together 
uh, and issue it. There was a great ownership, uh, certainly no surprises as, as we signed it out, as the Navy's design for maintaining maritime superiority. Now it hits you know, the fleet at large, if you will, and you read it. And uh, the, the words are as clear as they can be, uh, but there's still a lot of questions in people's mind. And so just like you would do with any other example of commander's guidance, you start to talk to people. And they start asking, well, what does this mean in this situation? How does this go? What, do you, what are your expectations here? And so we've uh, been doing that uh, in all the lines of effort. But because this one is the newest and uh, people are, are uh, most curious about it, that conversation to gain everybody's real deep understanding has has been going on. It's probably the most um, rich conversation in terms of actually forging a way forward. And so uh, I would say that uh, overall, yeah, I'd have to give us maybe a C in uh, that area. Uh, one, the Navy, no doubt about it, is committed uh, to getting after this. And uh, so there's that. Uh, you know, just like with all of the other lines of effort, you know, they don't exist as independent variables, right? They, there's a lot of overlap and influence of one on the other. Uh, the green line of effort, this learning one, permeates into everything, but probably most into the goal line of effort, in particular leader development, and how do we train leaders to uh, go out and instill this uh, fast learning. And, and then learning at sort of the division work center level is a lot different than learning at the fleet level. Uh, and so you know, how, how about that? So you know, we're exploring all those questions, uh, but the enthusiasm is, is tremendous out there. People are really attaching themselves to it. I've got, you know, I've got this effort to reduce administrative distractions out there. It's, uh, in this area, I would have to give myself an F, okay? And uh, you really are a nuke. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, yeah, we just have, uh, for whatever reason, we've been unable to uh, get our mind around that and actually offer up some programs to kill. I've, yeah, I started this when I was at uh, submarine forces, and then at naval reactors, and now as you know, and and uh, there's a, you know, there's a. Uh, a hesitation or reluctance to identify those things. So we're going to go after that more aggressively, but I think that also uh, is essentially intertwined with this fast learning thing, right? We've got to create space for people to go out and do these sorts of uh, fast learning types of things, right? Uh, which involves a lot more doing than computing or writing or, you know, reading, that sort of thing. And so, uh, so we've got to, yeah, I think that our thinking is much clearer now after discussing this around the, the force for a while. Uh, we've recently, in fact, just last week, I had a discussion up at the Naval War College who's going to take the lead for this line of effort for us uh, going forward. Uh, they have so many other uh, tools at their disposal up there. First, the faculty is just world class in this area. Second, they run so many of our other leadership programs, the Navy Leadership and Ethics Center, they, you know, and the Senior Enlisted Academy, I just spoke at the 200th graduation uh, of the Senior Enlisted Academy. And so bringing this all together, uh, injecting this, uh, you know, how, how do we learn into leadership development, I think we'll start to make some progress very quickly soon. Okay, thanks. Thank Robbie. Admiral, thank you very much. Uh, Robbie Harris, former Naval Thank you for your comments. About Distinguished naval person, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> it almost goes without saying, right? You've got a mic there for <laughs> you, Rob. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for your optimism regarding, and I'll use the acronym, thank you for your optimism regarding dealing or overcoming A2AD. And we don't hear much of that optimism, right. to, be, to be candid with you. Well, sir, but it's I, inherently defensive, as I said. Well, we're sort of, you know, So here, here's a question for you, so you know. Um, uh, appreciating your optimism, but is that optimism, is that justified, assuming that the Budget Control Act continues, and assuming that we have a Navy somewhere between 270 and maybe 300 ships? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so let's talk about the Budget Control Act first and foremost. Uh, I think all assumptions and optimism are uh, off the table when we start with you know, budget levels uh, 
uh, at, at sort of BCA levels, sequestration types of levels. And so that would make uh, things extremely difficult to, to execute any of this balance that Admiral Daly talked about between maintaining a ready force for today uh, while modernizing for the future, also taking care of our people. You know, that all gets into the mix. Uh, when we start to talk about that. With respect to the force level, we're doing an awful lot of thinking this summer. And in fact, it's all coming to a closure now and we're, we're sort of digesting it and marinating in it. Uh, what do we do with all of this data that will get at exactly sort of the balance that Admiral Daly described. Uh, some of it is talking about future fleet designs and fleet architectures to meet the challenge of the future. Some of it is sort of, hey, you know, we have a lot of the fleet that's going to be around for a while. How do we make best use of that? What is our force structure uh, that's required, both in the near term and then in the far term, dovetailing in those technologies as they become available? And so the force size, you know, your question about 275 ships moving up to 300, we're on a growth path there, as you point out. Uh, but I think more to follow in the near future in terms of how we're going to see our, our future and, and what that may entail for force size and composition. If I could just jump in here, I mean, you talked about the, the level of the budget, and that is in itself an issue, especially when you have caps like the BCA. Right. But how about just the fact that, could you just talk for a minute, I know you've testified to this, but how about the, what it does to you yeah. as the Navy leader when you can't get a enacted and appropriated right. budget. So these are two of the three whammies that I described uh, when we started to just describe the, uh, the challenges that we face. The first one is the, the uh, matter that you pointed out, which is that the fleet is running very hard. It has been running very hard for 15 years, and uh, that has a consequence. That has a consequence on our people uh, that, who are They've been at sea a lot. You know, they've been deploying a lot, uh, coming off of 10 year, I'm sorry, 10 year, 10 month deployments in some cases. So, and then when you bring those systems back, you know, the people are, are worn out. The systems are worn out, right? The, the material, of our ships and aircraft, you bring them in for maintenance and you find that, hey, that job that used to be predicted to, to kind of be this size, is now bigger because we've been going longer and harder than uh, than we thought, and so you know that that throws off some of your assumptions. You spend more time in maintenance, and and, and that cascades down. So, so one whammy is that the fleet has been run hard for 15 years, and that has effects. That has consequences. Two is the budget levels, and they've got to be adequate. And the fact that we sort of start our conversations with the BCA and work our way up. You know, that's just work that we have to do every single year. And then finally, I think uh, your point about the predictability yes. of the budget. You know, we just went into year number nine of a uh, continuing resolution, uh, and that also has consequences. It uh, injects a stutter step into a uh, system that really thrives by predictability and confidence. Right? So when we talk about delivering things on time, when we talk about delivering things at the lowest possible cost to the taxpayer, which I'm completely committed to doing, all of that gets uh, perturbed in the wrong direction uh, by these stutter steps in, uh, in predictability, these, these uh, budget you know, continuing resolutions. And if you think about that, how behavior has modified over the course of now nine years, you know, nobody puts anything at risk in the first quarter. Nothing important happens in the first fiscal quarter because it's just so vulnerable. And so try and be you know, a Fortune 10 company trying to compete uh, out there against your, you know, your, your peers or near peers. Uh, throw on top of that, we're talking about national security, and do that in three out of four fiscal quarters. Uh, very difficult. Yes, especially for those big capital projects? Well, the, you know, of course, there's nothing new starts under a continuing resolution, right? So there's no authorities to do that. But I'll tell you also, uh, even things, uh, you know, our, our uh, facilities, you know, those have a lot of contracts associated with just managing those facilities. Often you have to double the contracting load, right? Because you have to write 
a brand new contract just to cover that period of the continuing resolution. And then you come in with another contract to finish out the rest of the year. And so as we are all committed to reducing headquarters numbers and uh, overhead, if you will, everybody's in on that. But these sorts of uh, things, you know, they make it hard. I've just sort of, I'm writing two contracts in many instances when one should have done. Right to that. Mitzi. It's right behind you, Mitzi. I'm, it's wonderful to see you again, Admiral. I'm Mitzi Worth. I'm with the Naval Postgraduate School. Um, I'm a social anthropologist by training and was lucky enough to come to the Navy 40 years ago. It's a little hard to believe that, but boy, have things changed. What is Kath, I think this is where we do the emergency exit, when the, uh, <laughs> when the social anthropologist comes to the mic. <laughs> a word that has struck me that is now in the conversation that I just heard for the first time this year is called relationships. And I heard both the Vice President and the Secretary of Defense use it when he was speaking at CNAS this spring. What strikes me is when I came to the Navy, it was always a competition between the services. Now you recognize you need to work together. The word complexity is now very much a part of the way you think about it. This is all so much harder. Um, and I've said this to you before, if you want to have accelerated learning, I think you need to take the term from Apple Computer, the most successful corporation in the world, and which is, if you don't know ask, we all learn together. Now, I've been to so many meetings in the, with the military where they use your A2D2 terms and not everybody knows what it is, and they walk out not knowing what they heard. And so I think your whole idea of explaining in a way that non-experts can understand will accelerate the learning for your entire team and the fact that you're working collaboratively really thrills me. Mitzi, I have to ask you, because of our rules, would you ask a question though? <laughs> Please. How will you do this? <laughs> Thank you, Pete. I, would have I tried to help. I tried to help, there, but you know, uh, <laughs> it didn't work. Yeah. Well, I, uh, yeah, I, in many areas in this uh, learning line of effort, as we think about those things that we can do to stimulate the right type of mindset and behaviors in the fleet, uh, a lot of it, particularly for senior leaders, comes down to going to the right places and asking the right questions, right? We're not gonna you know, just dictate solutions. Uh, and so how do we get at that? Well, uh, oftentimes, and I know this is gonna shock many of you, but uh, when I go visit a particular command, uh, the commander or maybe you know, three echelons above the commander will take me to the most bright and shiny area of that command and then we will talk about all the success that that uh, space or that area entails. And, uh, and that's fine, that's a part of the program for sure. Uh, but it's much more useful to me if that commander takes me to the area where he's having actually the hardest challenge, right? This is the area where I'm struggling the most. And then we can have a conversation, well, why is it so hard? You know, let's talk about that, let's explore that. And, and what are you doing about it? You know, what, what's your first try? And how is that going? And, and uh, when will you know that uh, you're making some uh, progress? And uh, how can I help you? Uh, and if we all get comfortable going to those hard areas and having those conversations in an area that's not a press, a, a, a climate that's not oppressive, that's just really focused on the solutions. And if we could get all of our senior leadership to do that, then we start to stimulate this uh, conversation and set of behaviors uh, that really gets at, okay, let's just go talk about the hard things rather than gloss over the hard things by taking us to the easy solutions, you know, the successful things. Some do, you're right, uh, many do. And so, uh, so it's, not, you know, it's not a new idea. You know me well enough to know that I'm not smart enough to have a new idea. So uh, I just, uh, I can find uh, others with great ideas. Uh, then in terms of uh, being clear thinking, uh, we hoped that we set a good example of that with the design. We had many uh, languages to choose from to publish that and we chose English. 
And uh, <laughs> so as you read it, uh, I hope that it speaks in clear terms. There are very few, if any, acronyms in that. Uh, you don't have to be 10 years inside the Beltway to get a sense of what it's saying. And then uh, to your point about asking questions, again, here I think example is a very powerful thing. I, I rarely you know, understand what an acronym is. In fact, uh, you, you get to sort of do the, the days that I have, you'll see the same acronym come through <laughs> four <laughs> times and it'll mean four completely different things. And so I'm always stopping and asking, I don't want to make any bad assumptions that I know what you're talking about. Could you explain that a little more thoroughly? And again, I think, you know, senior leadership, just like with the questions, go to the hard places, ask the right questions. Uh, we can uh, start to maybe turn this corner. Yeah, I, I go to all hands calls, and I uh, used to, well, my first one, when I was a rookie, so you know, uh, I thought, well, geez, this team is just going to be riveted by, by every word, you know, and uh, what I got instead was a lesson about how fast the United States sailor can fall asleep, you know, when, he's, when, he's, when they're not interested, and so, you know, it was... Not, 90 seconds is about you know, the average. And so uh, what we do now is uh, really just highlight how much respect for, I, I have for that team uh, because they have so many choices today. Uh, they're so talented. And then uh, open it up to questions. And just like today, there's sort of a microphone. You know, usually they have standing mics. And in no time at all, every standing mic in the room is, you know, there's a line 10 deep. And uh, so they start asking questions. Um, and it's not just that, it's uh, the tone of the questions and the sophistication of the questions and the whole thing is just absolutely uplifting in terms of uh, what you know, your sailors are concerned with, uh, what is on their mind, uh, how much of, uh, they want to just get at, uh, uh, to a better place. And so it's, uh, yeah, I think that they're uh, empowered to ask questions. Um, you know, and we want to make sure that just as they're 10 deep at every mic uh, at my all hands calls and, and other all hands calls, so they're empowered to speak up at every level of their chain of command. Okay, let's spread it around here. This gentleman over here. Admiral, I'm, uh, my question, I'm Ted Kay, and I'm talking a little bit about information warfare and effects. And so the, my question is, how would you define the capacity to engage when you're talking about the future family of ships? Each ship different capacity to engage. You mean, uh, how, how do you define engagement? It's a combination of the weapon system or the kinetic effect with the okay. IW system. How does that work? Uh, uh, well, I mean, what do you want, like a Jane's fighting ship thing? I'm, uh, no, sir, I, I'm, I'm coming from the same school. Yeah. The issue is, in order, to, in order to get an effective weapon on target, for example, yeah. you need to have a queue, which yeah. comes from a lot of resources. Yeah. that are all tied together. So. Okay. So uh, well, we, we, we uh, obviously exercise that uh, a lot, right? And uh, whether we do that uh, from, at every level of evaluation, right? So some of these are just sort of tabletop, you know, do the systems talk to one another? Is it physically possible? And then of course, as you know, uh, what might be theoretically physically possible in a uh, in a classroom or a boardroom or some tabletop or a lab, uh, you know, you've got to get that out and get some salt water mixed in, atmospheric effects, you know, the whole nine yards. And so it's got to translate into fleet experimentation, fleet exercises. And uh, what we're finding is that uh, we're able to do more and more uh, synthetically in a virtual environment. The models are much more sophisticated now than they were. We're validating those models against real world performance and so that part of our education and that part of our achieving that you know, successful engagement and everything that's involved with it, uh, more and more of that can be done uh, in, in a synthetic or virtual environment. And that includes multi-party, right? And so we can stitch together different elements of that uh, system uh, even though they're geographically dispersed in, in a very realistic scenario. But even uh, with all of that, there are some things that can't be done except by going out and doing them, right? And you know, sort of my community, the submarine community, learned a valuable lesson about that at the start of World War II, where we just had a, it took us a year and a half, two years to get 
confidence in our torpedoes that they would actually home and, and detonate as they were designed to do. And so we want to make sure we never get into that place again. And so we do enough of that type of testing to ensure that we've got the requisite confidence. So that's in the systems that we have. Uh, and then there are those new possibilities. As uh, we mentioned, uh, we can now look at new connections, new connectivity, new possibilities in terms of sensor platform weapon combinations. And so that's kind of the horizon on which we're, that we're exploring. Uh, and we're doing that very practically as well, right? So this is not just uh, something that's in a PowerPoint or something that's on a, a computer screen. We're actually at sea doing those things. And uh, if you can start to think about that type of an approach prolif proliferating, uh, and you've got to make sure that you've got the requisite security, the requisite reliability and all those connections, all of that kind of comes with it. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic. And then, of course, you, know, you, you started with information warfare, I think, uh, and a big and growing part of this is sort of information warfare, whether that be cyber, electromagnetic, you know, RF spectrum type stuff. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily have to be kinetic in the traditional sense. So all of that's being explored. I remain optimistic. Okay, far side here. Hi, CNO. Chris Cavus, Defense News. Um, just as a communicator, I think anybody who wants to drop jargon is, is, is doing a great job, so bonus to you. Um, if, now, for all the reasons you just said, A2AD is a confusing term. Um, people expend time trying to figure out what it is, come up with all kinds of different answers. What can you do about the third offset? Well, uh, it, just like uh, everything else, you just continue to ask questions, right? And so I encourage everybody to continue to ask challenging questions about what exactly is meant by the third offset. And so it includes you know, elements of a lot of different things. It includes, and you've heard uh, Secretary Work speak about this as much as anybody, Chris, um, the fact that uh, there's going, some of the new capabilities, slant technologies right around the corner, right over the horizon, or maybe even here amongst us, things like artificial intelligence, things like new ways of man-machine teaming, all of those things are gonna be part of that. Uh, but to me, and uh, Secretary Work and I have discussed this, uh, and I think we're in agreement, that uh, we're in, a, we're in a, a, a period of time where no one idea is gonna be king for very long. Right, and so we may uh, achieve an advantage, but if we're not thinking about the next three, four steps down the road to maintain that advantage, someone's gonna catch up or surpass us very, very quickly. It's just the nature of the environment right now. Technology proliferates very fast, information even faster. And so if we're not thinking about pace, you know, not only this idea, but the next three moves uh, then we're going, to, we're going to be caught out of position. We're just going to be caught behind. And so I think that this idea of you know, pace of innovation, getting speed to the fleet, is as much a part of the third offset as any single technology that's going to be uh, part of that solution. Okay, we have time for one more question. Is the hour over already, Pete? Is it? Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. That lady far on the, my right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Admiral Richardson, and thank you for giving me the last question. Um, my name is Lin Kwok, and I'm from Brookings Institution. I was wondering whether I could turn your attention now to the South China Sea. Um, could you give me a better understanding of what sort of pressure the Navy can bring to bear on activities which are problematic but not necessarily unlawful, such as island building and construction activities over features um, on which sovereignty is still disputed. Thank yeah. you very much. Okay, thanks. Um, and that's you know, a terrific uh, geographical area, very interesting, that brings a lot of what we've talked about to you know, very clear focus. Uh, I've had a chance to discuss the situation in the South China, sea, South China Sea with my counterpart, Admiral Wu Sheng Li of the People's Liberation Army Navy, as well as with the other regional, uh, my counterparts in that region. And so, uh, you know, one thing I think uh, is important to appreciate is that it's not just a bilateral U.S.-China thing down there. There are an awful lot of 
of nations with huge stakes in how this comes out. And so watching that security dynamic play out uh, with everybody uh, participating is uh, one thing that we, we must keep in mind, right? Uh, uh, with respect to what options the United States Navy can bring, uh, with all of the partners in the region, uh, including China, you know, there are many areas in which we've got common interests, even you know, today. Uh, often those are glossed over, but there's an awful lot of areas where we do have common interests, and, uh, and we have to uh, make sure that we pile in and reinforce those areas where our interests align. Uh, there are areas uh, where certainly we have, we don't agree. And uh, as we work through those disagreements towards a compromise, uh, both, uh, well, I think everybody's uh, desire in the region, all naval leaders in, in, uh, especially, uh, would want to do so in a way that mitigates the risk of some kind of a miscalculation or escalation uh, that would just send us in the wrong direction. And so the hope is that we'll reach an agreement that's acceptable to all players in the region, including the United States, including China, and everybody else, uh, in a way that uh, does not involve conflict. And uh, so certainly we wouldn't want to do any deliberate conflict, but we'd also want to make sure that we don't do any kind of uh, calculate, uh, conflict that results from a miscalculation or a mistake. And so one good uh, thing that uh, the Navy, the, all the navies have adopted in that area is this idea of cues. And I talk about this cues uh, quite a bit because it's such a great example of how we can manage our way towards uh, dispute resolution without uh, creating problems, particularly conflict. And it's a, a code for behavior uh, when we encounter each other in an unplanned encounter at sea. Uh, all the navies down there have adopted it. It's been very successful. I was on the John C. Stennis uh, in, uh, in, as the strike group was deployed to the South China Sea, and we were there, and uh, we were there with a, lo a lot of ships from other navies, uh, particularly uh, the Chinese Navy. And there were many, many encounters uh, between U.S. Navy ships and others. And every one of those encounters, by and large, not 100%, but the vast majority were conducted uh, right in accordance with this, these cues that uh, you know, allow us to use all the tools uh, that the nation has in its, you know, all the dimensions of our influence and power to come to a conflict resolution. And so uh, our job as the Navy is just to make sure that one, you know, we're there, right? We're, we're present there. Uh, don't have many options if you're not there, and so we're gonna, we are there, and we're gonna stay there, and uh, we've made that very clear. Uh, we're gonna continue to enhance these uh, sort of rules of behavior, right? The advocating for rules and norms of behavior that will allow us to peacefully resolve uh, differences. And uh, then it was very important, I think, that uh, Admiral Wu and I have a dialogue so that in the rare event or unlikely event of something uh, uh, happening, we can get on the phone with one another, uh, de-escalate quickly, you know, and, and keep this thing in context uh, so that we, we get to our, an end state that's, as I said, acceptable by all in a way that doesn't involve conflict. Thank you. Admiral, uh, our time is up, but on behalf of CSIS and the U.S. Naval Institute, we thank you for your time today. We know it's precious. We also want to acknowledge once again our sponsors, Lockheed Martin and Huntington Ingalls, uh, for sponsoring this entire uh, series uh, this year. So again, we thank you and uh, we appreciate your time. Well, I'm very grateful for the chance to be here. Thank you all for your uh, terrifically insightful questions. And I, I like events like this because our thinking gets sharper by virtue of you challenging it. So thanks for the challenges. Thank you. Thank you.